ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, 70s podcast today, and look, let's talk about Raw and SmackDown and AEW, that's what we're going to talk about this week, because that's all there is to talk about, what else is there to talk about, you know, NBA is not really doing much right now, you know, we had the press conference between, you know, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George with the Clippers, outside of that, nothing much was talked about, um, so as far as wrestling goes, there was a lot, a lot of stuff going on this week, starting off with Raw, with the Raw reunion, um, the show was okay with me, because there's a lot of legends I was happy to see, you know, Hulk Hogan, I was okay seeing, but then I'm like, you know, he just has a bad vibe to him, like, despite the fact that he's, you know, might be, he's like at least 25%, if not 50% forgiven in the WWE universe, so to speak, you know, of his past actions, but a lot of people are still, like, shitting on him, and I, I, I can't be mad at them for it, you know, I'm over it, it's just that now, I feel like there's no need for Hogan to be there, but, I mean, so Hogan had nothing to do with Monday Night Raw anyway, he was barely, when he, he left around the time Raw was a thing, you know, if it was WrestleMania, I understand, but Raw, Raw is more the new generation to now era, not Hulk Hogan era. That that that's my take on it. But anyways, you know the fact that there's a lot of wrestlers and legends there that I didn't understand why they were there. Like for example, I mean I'm not mad at being seeing Melina there. You know I always question what happened to her over the years, and I sh- she just gave up on wrestling, looking to live life. Um, uh, Candice Michelle. You know, when she was there, no reaction for her. Like, it's like it's funny. People were talking about her on Twitter of her coming back. But yet, when she came on Raw in Tampa, freaking no reaction. She, she did a twirl, which was, oh, God, it was just as bad as it was when she was there. I'm sorry. I, I, I just hate that twirl. It does nothing for me. I mean, if it was anyone else that was thick doing that, maybe there would be something there. Maybe... People might get a reaction, but Candice, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just talking nonsense at this point. You know, Alicia Fox was there. And I don't know why she's in that list of legends, quote-unquote legends, to be a part of everyone else, you know. And and, and people like Jonathan Coachman didn't make sense. Because doesn't Coach work for the WWE? Doesn't Coach... I said this on my Raw review. Dude... Isn't he in the, um, the, the kickoff shows, the kickoff analysis, the kickoff and analyze show before the pay-per-views, right? Isn't he there? So why is he, after like he's, like he's never been in WWE in over three, two years, you know? I was like, stop, relax, you know? Eve Torres came through, I, I wasn't, I, I mean, I thought this was about legends. Eve Torres isn't a legend to me. She was great. I love her. I'm a fan of E. Taurus. But, legend? When I think legend, like you have to do something big for you to be a legend. So Eve didn't do much. She killed Zack Ryder's career. I, I guess you want to count that. <laughs> Outside of that, what else did she do? Lily Garcia Fair. You know, she started uh, announcing WWE since 1999. Ever since then, moving on. You know, until 2009, then she came back in 2012, and then left in 2016, I think, maybe? I might be wrong. But, yeah, pretty much that. Santino, been a while since we've seen the man, you know? He retired, I think, 2014, 15, around there. And then, um, you know, he's had he's had great moments in the past, funny segments. That Elimination Chamber is still my favorite thing about Santino, without a doubt. Uh... You know, X-Pac, you know, DX, NWO, slash Outsiders, you know, you know, you know, you know, the original, you know, same old, same old, Ric Flair, Booker T coming through, Kurt Angle was there, shockingly Van Damme, I, I, I didn't know where that, where that came from, Rob Van Damme, I thought he was with Impact, and then Impact was like, I, I realized that Impact said it was fine that, for Van Damme to show up on Raw Reunion, why not? They called up, they had a discussion, and then they able to make it happen. I guess Impact is more open to things than before. Before, shit, there will be exclusive and stuff, you know. Um, her, pretty much, yeah, you know. I just feel like that Hulk Hogan promo was just not what was needed. The Stone Cold story, 
you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin telling a story of his, you know, with his friends and family and whatnot, you know, in in the ring. It was great. It was it was what was needed to end the show. But Hulk Hogan cutting out that cheesy, godforsaken promo, it wasn't needed, dude. I could have went. I could have just had him come out, do his, what you're going to do, brother. And then that, well, that was it. I didn't need him to come out and just thank everybody and calling people out. I, stop. Stop pandering. I, I can't. I can't. But yeah. So what I'm what I'm trying to get to is um, with the Raw reunion show is that WWE TV ratings declined double digits from last year, but WWE sees positive positives in the numbers. Um, as previously reported, WWE announced their earnings for the second quarter of 2019. Television ratings for both Raw and SmackDown were down double digits from the prior year quarter. Raw averaged a 1.99 rating, down 40% from 2.33 in 2018. And SmackDown averaged a 1.7 rating for QT, um, or Q2, down 11% from 1.1 in the same period last year. The decline in television ratings for both shows exceeded the 8% drop in cable television ratings during the same quarter. WWE co-president George Berrios, Berrios, don't know how to pronounce his name, sorry, did see some positive regarding the television ratings. It was noted that the, that the decline in ratings was getting better as the quarter went on. While Raw was down 21% in April from the prior year quarter, it was down 8% in May and 11% in June. SmackDown Live was down 90% in April, 8% in May, and 7% in June and from the same period last year. During the, the, the quarter, cable TV ratings were down 12% in April, 9% in May, 7% in June, so the declines for Raw and SmackDown in May and June were more in line with cable. WWE's also compared the, client, the, uh, the decline from Q1 to June alone, in the first quarter I guess, to June alone, stating that Raw ratings declined 40% in quarter one from the prior year quarter. but improved to a, a year-over-year -year decline of 11% in June. The same goes for for SmackDown, which declined 30% in the first quarter 2019, but improved to a decline of 7% in June, consistent with the ratings performance of the top 25 cable networks, which declined 7% during the month. It should be noted that ra that, the ra that ratings for QT, or Q2, it keeps saying QT, <laughs> Q2, we're still down 8.3% from Q1 for Raw and 4% for SmackDown. So, I guess this is a quote here from, I believe, from uh, the co-president. We have definitely turned the corner, WWE CEO Vince McMahon said. Oh, we have executive directors for each brand now. Notwithstanding that we have spent more time on storyline, good on good ones, and also talent development. I don't know about good storylines. Where are where are they? I, I haven't seen them, so that's just me. It it's a combination of a lot of things, all good things thus far coming together in what I guess I'd call a relaunch in regards to our content. One thing I that I noticed in my research is that raw ratings or that ratings for raw have improved since WWE stopped having wrestling during commercial breaks, with the exceptions of inset ads. Since the superstar shakeup in April, raw ratings have been an average of three percent higher for for the episodes following the change, excluding last week's raw reunion, which would make it 8.2 percent higher. SmackDown has been has only been up 0.5% uh, since the change, although the past two weeks have garnered the last or the largest audience since the Superstar Shakeup. Burials also noted that ratings for July are up 1% from the prior year quarter, but he admitted that it was bolstered by last week's Raw reunion. The audience for the Raw reunion special was up 11% for the same week in 2018. Without that episode, the ratings for July are down from the prior year quarter. <sighs> so, I guess they find any any positive, any any rise up with the viewership 
is a positive in their odds. Whether it's 1%, 5%, 0.5%, it doesn't matter how. I guess that's how they see it, you know? As long as there's a, a up, if there's a down, then that's the issue, you know? Now, I want to know. Sid Vicious was scheduled to be on this show, but he didn't show up. I was like, where's my boy Sid? Where, 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 where's Psycho Sid? I want to I hear that re, 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 re music, you know? I was hyped. You know, what, 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 what happened to my boy Sid? Uh, uh, let's see. As pre previously reported, former two-time WWE Champion Psycho Sid Fishes, Inc., formerly known as Psycho Sid, was the only legend advertised for Raw Reunion that did not appear. While no, specific, no specifics were given, Sid reportedly pulled out of the show several days ago, according to Dave Meltzer on the Wrestling Observer Radio. WWE apparently knew that Sid would not be appearing before they created the graphic for the Raw Reunion shirt below, which was released last week. Sid was also not featured in updated uh, promotional material before the show. Since leaving WWE in 1997, Sid only appeared on a pair of Raws in 2012 as a part of Raw 1000. Sid defeated Heath Slater on an episode of Raw leading up towards the special also appeared on the Raw 1000 itself as a, peer, as a part of a segment where several legends beat up Heath Slater and Lita beating Heath Slater with uh, the help of the Acolyte Protection Agency, APA. So there's that. Um, again, Robert Union was a decent to good show to me, you know. Match-wise, it was trash. You know, there wasn't many matches that I actually cared about. Roman Reigns versus Samoa Joe was probably the worst freaking match on the show in my eyes. Just saying. The tag team match with the Usos and the Revival were good. You know, with Devon being at ringside, which was weird. And, you know, like th that's how I look at it. Uh, so we got Jim Ross here to, uh, giving us details why he turned down the Raw reunion offer. So here we go. I'm, I'm not going to read, you know, all this extra shit. I'm just going to read what JR said, okay? Well, it wasn't in anger that I refused or turned it down, Ross said. I, pr I appreciated the opportunity to come back to Tampa to see all my buddies and so forth. There's a couple a couple of things that led to this decision, and the main thing for me was if I had gone there, there would be a certain segment of the social media society that would have said, uh-oh, there's trouble in paradise. JR looking to bail already. He's already back in w with WWE. Something's wrong with AEW. And, and that's that's pretty much what JR said. End quote. Ross made it clear that nothing is wrong with his relationship with AEW. He also commented on how strong his relationship with Khan and Khan's reaction to the offer. Ross also was also really worried about the message that the Raw appearance would send to the young AEW roster as he works with them and mentors them while they prepare to being on the big TNT TV debut on Wednesday, October 2nd. JR added that he was afraid that his, his Raw reunion appearance would cause confusion when it comes to his messages to the AEW roster about teamwork and having a team mentality. He continued, well, first of all, there's nothing wrong with my relationship with AEW. I have a great relationship with Tony Khan, who know who owns the, the damn thing. Tony said, if you want to go to Raw Reunion, I think you should go to, to the Raw Reunion, if you want to. But I got to thinking about it, and I didn't want to approach the issue of, well, there's trouble in paradise, JR's are going to bail, I've taken on this role with these kids in AEW that I really embrace, and I love it. I'm an old, I'm an old coach at heart. There's a lot of kids there who are trying to learn how do, how do we get from being somewhat of a hidden or not mass appeal indie star to going to the next level and becoming a star on the live weekly international TV show in October on TNT. I'm quite, I'm wondering what message I would have sent to the to these younger younger guys. JR is our guy. He's been preaching unity. He's been preaching teamwork and he goes back to the big evil empire and for a one night stand for a payday. So pretty much JR, the way he's coming off here is like if he would have went to Raw, AEW crew would look at him and be like 
So you're gonna come here and preach all this nonsense, say all this stuff, you know, preach all this positive stuff towards us, and then yet you you go back to your former employer for a a, a paycheck, TV time, and like you know, for a one night stand, pretty much. So Jr. took it as he didn't want to go there because if he did, you know, people would look at him in a different way. Plus. Uh, in the fans' eyes, and he's, uh, in my opinion, I think JR is talking to those retarded fans that will take something like that and try to spin it and be like, oh, oh, look, there's some, there's something going on backstage. Because why would, why would AEW let JR go back to WWE for that Raw reunion? And then it will help Vince Russo to come out and be like, see, I told you. I told you, AEW and WWE are working behind the scenes. It's possible. So JR was smart. I'm glad JR didn't go. What would they what would they do with JR there anyway? Be on commentary, be overshadowed by fucking Corey Graves and Michael Cole? Huh? Well, JR's gonna say is by God and good God almighty and his and his and his catchphrases and stuff? Is that what they would bring JR for? What would they have JR do? Nothing. Nothing. JR didn't need to be on the show. It was good. Good. I'm good. I'm glad JR did not go. JR said it would have been uh, fun to call a few matches with, the, with Jerry Lawler, but it wasn't a given, and he never got to discuss creative plans with the WWE. He said the creative was a reason he didn't go back, and not, but not the reason going back to the optics. While AEW boss Khan had given JR his approval to make a WWE appearance, JR also said he didn't want to take advantage of Khan's ger uh, generosity. The reason was, I didn't want to send a mixed message to the young kids. I'm trying to mentor and get them in a locker room mentality. And even though Tony was trying to, uh, trying to allow me, uh, Tony Khan, I didn't want to take advantage of his generosity. It just didn't seem to be the right fit. I wasn't angry about it. I really, really appreciated Vince taking the time out of his schedule to contact me because he didn't have to. Could have had, um, could have had a million minions that could have done it, and a lot of them would have liked to would have liked to because if I had said no they then they could run back to Vince and say he's not coming JR turned us down let's pow on that son of a bitch let's get the dirt going so I'm trying to find where, where I left off so that's the reason I, t I thought it was sending a, me a mixed message to the locker room that I am currently in and I didn't want that to happen so so JR continued, I'm glad they did. I'm glad they did. It was cool. I appreciated Vince thinking of me, but it just didn't seem like the right thing to do in my current role. Even though my current boss said go, I just didn't think that it was the right thing to do for that locker room and those young kids that are looking up to me to give them advice and guidance. I want to be loyal to my brand and my team. And these kids that are looking up to me for guidance and advice and support and positive motivation, I didn't think going to Raw was a positive motivator for the 20 somethings in our locker room who re still wide eyed and bushy tailed trying to figure out what the hell I'm getting myself into he added so again JR made the right move if he did go then the locker room will look at him differently they'll be like dude you know, we, we, we don't know about you now. Like, if he did wet, then the locker room would question JR. They will look at him and give him the benefit of the doubt. They wouldn't really be how he... Like, they wouldn't be acting the way how they act with him now if he did wet back to Raw. If he, if he didn't... If he did, did go back to Monday Night Raw reunion, then I guess in, in his mind, the locker room would look at him and be like, JR, man, we don't know. You could be here and then you'll leave the next time. Like, we don't know what's going on. So, like, what if what if the AEW needed JR the most and then JR left for whatever, you know? Like, maybe it was one of those situations. Like, JR is saying, like, I'm staying with what I have now. AEW is my life now. WWE was then. AEW is now and maybe forever, you know? That's the, that's the way to... Put, push WWE's, uh, you know, little slogan there. 
Let's see, what else is there? John Cena introduces girlfriend to friends back to I really don't want to talk about this, but yeah, let's see, let's hope this be a short as I right, it's a short one. So apparently John Cena's got a new wifey now. <laughs> I honestly don't care. He's he he got a new girlfriend. Alright, now low key, I'm thinking in my head at when I heard this, I'm like, okay. How does Nikki Bella feel about this? <laughs> Because I remember her saying that she's so she's still sensitive around about John Cena. So I'm thinking to myself, how is she acting right now? She low key, she's probably thinking now, if she was on camera or anything, she's gonna be like, Oh, I'm happy for John, you know, he's able to find love, blah 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 blah, right? But in her head, I I know, I know in her head she's like Come on, man. <laughs> We, what we have was special. And you threw it all away. Damn. <laughs> I, I, low key. Low key. She won't admit it, but low key. Come on. Don't, don't, don't lie to me. <laughs> it looks like John Cena was excited to introduce his new girlfriend. 29 year old. Wow. 29. And, and he's 40. Okay. I, I, AJ, but. <laughs> AJ, <laughs> Ooh, all right, Kelly. All right, uh, 29 year old Shay. I'm not pronouncing her last name. Shay, 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 I'm gonna call her that. Fuck it. I can't pronounce the last part of her name. She cute. That's all I'm gonna leave it at that. Shay Shariah to his friends and co workers backstage at WWE as the couple were spotted. Backstage of the Raw reunion show earlier this week, it, it has now been nearly four months since rumors began about a romance between Cena and the I have no idea how to pronounce this word A V I G I L O N Avigilon Avig I'm sorry. <laughs> Product manager Shay Shirai. Sources that US Weekly reported that Cena was introducing people to her by name. He had his arm around her and was she was laughing. They look like a real cute couple. John is already very much uh, enamored with Shay at, at the source added Cena is really into Shay and excited about their new relationship because she's really smart and easy going. Another report by HollywoodLife.com says that the, the sources close to the situation have confirmed Shay as Cena's official gal friend. They've been dating for a few months, Shay's. So Shay's from Canada. Say a word. Hey, a Canadian. All right, all right, all right, John. I see you. I see you. Anyways, the report <laughs> indicates that things have been, have, e have even escalated, noting, I think he already had her ha meet his family. Wow, you, 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 you all the way with it now, John. I see you, John. And there's, already, there's like three, three to four photos, okay? You know, let the man live his life, please. Don't don't be weird about it. Don't bother him. Don't be like that fucking clown with that video camera in front of him. I think it was in London. I think it was that weirdo. Like even Drama Alert talked about it last week. Like, it, like fam, why are you doing this? You know, don't don't be like don't be like that guy. Don't be shoving the camera in front of John Cena's face. Don't be like trying to act like you all that, but you're not. You know, like Cena, uh, I'm surprised Cena was able to walk. I'm surprised John Cena is able to walk anywhere without fucking cameras like paparazzi all over him. You know what I mean? I'm thinking Cena was that huge that like paparazzi, that he can't be on the fucking street without paparazzi being on him 24-7. That's what I was thinking, but I guess that's not the case. Maybe if it was Rock, then that would be a different story. The Raw Reunion Special was the first time John Cena appeared on WWE TV since he performed as Dr. Orthogonomics at WrestleMania 35 this past April. As noted, Cena reportedly left the Raw Reunion immediately after his segment with Usos, Rikishi, Revival, and Devon concluded. Cena has recently been seen in England filming Fast and the Furious 9 along with Vin Diesel, Michelle Rodriguez, Chris Luda, Chris L Luda, L L L Luda, sorry, uh, and many other stars. The film is set to release on May 22nd, 2020. 
that might be the first Fast and the Furious movie I'm willing to watch in theaters because I have not watched one Fast and the Furious movie in theaters ever. I've seen uh, the most I've seen was to the first one, Tokyo Drift and Fast Five with The Rock in it. I think that was the first time The Rock was in uh, the Fast and Furious series. Yeah, all on TV. I never watched it in theater, so low key. This might be the first or second one comp compared to the one that's coming out now with, you know, The Rock and, uh, you know, I gotta do it. The Big Dog! Roman Reigns, so there's that. Uh, what else should I talk about? Okay, let's get on with Forbes.com. WWE may finally be getting through to Vince McMahon. WWE officials might be getting through Vince McMahon. Well, this is a long article for me to read. Fuck me. Okay, okay. Well, there we go. Vince McMahon may finally be seeing the light. According to the report of Fightful Select uh, Ringside News, the WWE boss is finally realizing that significant changes need to be made to its main roster product. It is said, quote, from Fire Select, it is said that Vince McMahon is coming to grips with the fact that the program needs to be upgraded as well. Finally, finally, it took him. I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. Let's let's count the years back. 2018, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13. And uh, I think 12. 12 was like the last good year with WWE. I don't know. But pretty much within the last six, seven freaking years, maybe the product can change for the better. I don't know. I don't know. WrestlingNews.co also adds that the, the, the declining ratings have forced Vince McMahon to ask for more input on the product, and he's listening to the criticisms more than ever. Thank God. Hallelujah. Please, please tell me this is happening. Please, Lord, tell me this is happening. WWE has, of course, already made two blockbuster changes to its programming, bringing back Heyman and Bischoff, two of the most creative yet controversial bookers in WWE history. To help run Raw and SmackDown, respectively, they have already been seen, or some, uh, I should say, some noticeable differences in the presentations of both brands in recent weeks, mainly coming in the form of an edgier product that feels like a subtle callback to the Attitude Era. That's reportedly part of WWE's plan to gradually move away from the PG Era, which has lasted a roughly, uh, which has lastly roughly. Uh, lasted roughly a decade in e in an effort to win back the company's uh, the company's teen uh, teen audience pretty much trying to win back the teen uh, teen audience in WWE because they're going over to you know the jumping ship they're going all the way to where a show that's going to be on on TNT anyways according to Wrestling Observer Dave Meltzer WWE like McMahon himself became very aware that the company was losing its teen audience, one of its most pivotal demographics, and that its young audience could disappear even further when AEW, All Elite Wrestling, becomes airing on TNT in October 2nd. Quote, They were very aware that they had lost touch with the teen majors. They were afraid of completely losing teenagers, especially when AEW starts. This di this is a, this is a direction they felt they had to go. So, judging off, the, but that's from Dave Meltzer himself saying that. Judging him saying that, it kind of says to me that you know I'm starting to get a WCW vibe, even though. You see, WCW wanted to go head to head with Vince. AEW does not. AEW wants to do their own thing, be that alt uh, alternative. They're not trying to run Vince out of the company, even though that's never going to happen anyway. Unless somehow Vince invested his money in bad shit, losing, 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 and you know, uh, all sorts of bad stuff in WWE happens. If that keeps going on, maybe, maybe they might, they might, you know, go under. But. That's not happening at this point, you know, so that, that, that's just my estimation on that, you know, they're not 
trying to go head to head with Vince. They're trying to be an alternative, and they are, pretty much. FIFO Selects also reports that WWE is targeting the critical 18 to 34 age demographic, noting that the lost generation of 1834 is going to be a t major target going forward. The teen and 1834 demographics are arguably the most important to WWE's long-term success. Many of those fans are relatively new to the wrestling products, so the thought process in th is that WWE needs to hook them in early in, e in an effort to make them long lifelong fans. The product WWE has been delivering, however, simply has not hasn't been good enough to capture the attention of those fans or even the average fan, as both Raw and SmackDown, but particularly the former, uh, have been quite lackluster over the past few years. The company needs to make some wholesale adjustments, and it's off to a good start with the hirings of Bischoff and Heyman, who ideally will be able to get in the ear of McMahon, gain some influence, and help tweak the product to both give it a more widespread appeal and ensure that it brings in fans from WWE's most coveted demographics. I really hope that they change by freaking SummerSlam. After that, that no excuses. New sets, new music, intros, bring back pyrotechnics. I know you're not broke. You got that Saudi money now. You good. So give me back my damn pyro. That's all I want. Give me what I want. Please. That's all I ask. All right. <sighs> the company needs to make some wholesome adjustments. Pretty much, okay? The thing is, everything still runs through McMahon, no matter how many changes are made to the creative team and or how many familiar or new faces are brought in in an attempt to revamp WWE's creative process. Uh, booking process as well. Perhaps that that's why a as FIFO Sonic reports those within the company are taking a wait-and-see approach during WWE's apparent transition to a new era another new era. Wow, like they need that one. One that has a lot more cooks in the kitchen even though McMahon is still the headmaster chief. That last fact has been perhaps WWE's biggest problem this decade. McMahon once touted as a creative genius and perhaps the best booker in pro wrestling history, has taken his fair share of criticism for his stick or, or stick to in initiativeness, which has chased away some of of the biggest names in the company history. Batista, who just retired at WrestleMania 35, has called WWE's creative process a nightmare, which, while former WWE star Dean Ambrose, now known as uh, John Moxley in AEW, has flat out said that Vince McMahon is the biggest problem. Vince McMahon is the problem. In Dean McMahon, perhaps, it is perhaps WWE's greatest asset and its biggest weakness. On one hand, on one hand, he's the man who put WCW out of business, who stands atop a billion dollar pro wrestling empire. On the other hand, there have been reports of him tearing up raw script at the last minute, rejecting countless storylines, pitches, and being difficult to work with. Other critics, meanwhile, have referred to McMahon as out of touch, which cate whichever category you fall into, it's hard to deny that changes could and should be made to WWE's main roster product which has seen significant decreases in everything from live event attendance to TV ratings to the numbers of WWE network subscriptions to merchandise sales in recent years. Although all of those things can be traced back to, the, to a product that despite featured perhaps the most talented assembled a symbol of rosters in wrestling history has been plagued by bad booking, poor st storytelling, meaningless feuds, and mundane matches. At the end of the day, McMahon is one who gets the praise for helping catapult WWE into the most successful periods. So, as the company's head honcho, he is also the one who gets the most criticism when the WWE product is down and rightfully so. But with WWE's creative process hitting a low point in 2019 as a competition from AEW heats up, it looks like 
WWE officials are finally getting through to McMahon, who knows that without significant changes being made, WWE could be at risk of losing even more of its audience. Plain and simple. Change or perish, pretty much. Now we got another story here from Vince McMahon, which is a bit odd. Okay. Vince McMahon says, WWE content will stay PG, won't revert back to the Attitude Era gory crap. The chairman of the board, Vince McMahon, said in his wrestling content, said that his wrestling content will stay in a PG environment and that the company is not going back to what he called the gory crap of its famed Attitude Era. It would be a bit edgier, however, he acknowledged that phrase was introduced by a media analyst question on WWE second quarter's 2019 earnings conference call. Quote, we just haven't come anywhere close, actually, to going to another level, McMahon said of loosening the family-friendly reins a bit. There will be something we do in terms of a direction of content, more controversy, better storylines, etc. But at the same time, we're not going to go back to the quote, attitude era, and we're not going to do blood and guts and things of that nature, such as being done on perhaps on a new potential competitor. That last part of his quote was referring to Upstart All Elite Wrestling AEW, which will launch a weekly wrestling show. This October on TNT, AEW has had a successful run of pay-per-view events and its locker room house houses many WWE alums like Jericho, Ambrose, uh, who now, again, goes by his indie name, John Moxley. Now, when I, 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 I saw this, and when I saw this, I'm like, Vince, you are a freaking idiot. When I think blood and guts, I think ECW. Okay, I think any other wrestling, I think any other indie wrestling company, most likely CCW, I keep hearing the most of when it comes to blood and guts and death matches and whatnot. Yeah, or Japan maybe, shit like that. I don't think Attitude Era as blood and guts. The only time blood is ever involved in matches or storylines in WWE is when they help enhance the storylines. Not all the time you need blood. I'm not saying you need blood all the time. I don't know. The more blood you have, then the less thing, the less important it, it becomes, you know? The thing is, I think blood should be in WWE when it comes to situations that where it's needed, you know? When you watch AEW's Double or Nothing, and you had Cody versus Dustin, right? And then you had Dustin. Dustin Rhodes bleed and the fact that he's his face was a crimson mask blood in his eyes he could barely see and yet he was still able to function shit like that it helps enhance the story that they're telling inside the ring that's what I want if somebody is beating up somebody backstage I low key hope for blood because I feel like oh shit they made you bleed your own blood you should fucking rage and kick their ass that's pretty much what that should be when it comes to if it's used in segments if it's in matches you know it depends on the situation you know so what about blood and guts he's saying it like Attitude Era was like Cut throw, freaking, you know, say what you want, do what you want, which it kind of was, but it wasn't blood and guts, you know, like ECW was. Like, I don't know where they're getting that from. Anyways, continuing to continue with what he said, we're not going to go back to that gory crap that we graduated from. McMahon continued, adding that a more sophisticated product attracts better writers and better managers. I feel really good about, about it. A little later on the call, McMahon again referred to AEW, though not by name, Blood and Guts, saying, "I can't imagine TNT will pull up, will put up with that. That the basic cable channel won't have to. The basic the basic cable channel will have to if what AEW co-founder talent and ex WWE superstar Cody Rhodes said Wednesday at the Television Critics Association press tour holds true." 
to be fair to Vince, not specifically saying the words All Elite Wrestling or its initials, the Pro Wrestling Promotion Turner Series is still untitled. We asked everyone involved on Wednesday why is that, or why that is. WWE missed on Wall Street's revenue expectation for QT, a Q2, I keep saying QT, Q2, but it beat on earning forecasts. So, again, pretty much, he said that he's not trying to go back to the, you know, back in the day where, you know, it was, all, in his words, gory crap, which you fucking put up yourself. You're acting like you didn't, you had, you didn't have a choice. You had a choice. You did what you had to do. So, I don't know. In the end of the day, I'm not saying they have to go back to the Attitude Era, but I'm saying being a little bit edgier. Maybe make make storylines a bit better in my eyes. You know, Seth Rollins sucks right now. I don't give a damn what anyone has to say about that. Seth Rollins sucks. And with, P, with WWE being PG, it kind of fucking makes things a bit hard for Seth Rollins in my eyes. I don't know. That's just my assessment. I don't know what you want to do with that. Oh, my God. Let me quote John Cena with this. Y'all just, y'all look like, y'all just, hold on, let me get this right, I don't want to mess this up. Y'all look just like your mugshots. How does it feel getting arrested? Well, Jimmy Uso can answer that. Not good, John, not good. So Jimmy Uso, again, fuck, dude, just like Jeff Hardy last week, getting arrested again. Ah, <sighs> fuck, dude. Okay. Following the, uh, this is on wallculture.com, by the way. And all the other uh, things I've been reading off were Forbes and uh, what was the other website? I forgot what it was. Shit. Uh, what was it? What was it? The Wrap. The Wrap.com. There we go. All right. Wallculture.com. Okay. So, Jimmy Uso got arrested driving under the influence again. For fuck's sake. Like, uh, Jimmy D.Y. Uso. That, that should be his fucking name. For fuck's sake, dude. I'm just saying, bro. Like, uh, if it was anyone else, if it was a normal dude on the street, I, you know, he's living his best life. I ain't mad at him. But you're a fucking WWE superstar, fam. You're taking this shit for granted in a way. You know what I'm saying? So, I feel like he should not be doing this too fucking often. Didn't this happen, like, uh, what was it, two months ago? Holy shit, dude. He needs to chill with that. So, in what has become pretty standard WWE procedure for any such incident over recent years, WWE statement uh, sim simpl simply cited how Jonathan Fatu is responsible for his own personal actions. Having posted a $1,000 bond, Jimmy has now been released from jail and is scheduled for a Florida court appearance on August 15th at 8.30 a.m. A TMC report claims that Uso was swerving across the road before he was pulled over by the police officer. Uh, Jimmy refused to take DUI tests on the scene and then was arrested for DUI and speeding. For those who tune in, in, in to watch uh, this week's Raw Reunion show on Monday, you will be aware, well aware that Johnson and Uso's puff fun at Jimmy's drunk driving arrest. No, actually, I think he was, I think Cena was joking about both of them. They both have been arrested before. The, 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 the one, one that was not clean. One and the other has been arrested in, in the past couple of years, okay? Uh, Cena and Uso's puff fun at, you know, Jimmy's drink, uh, drinking, driving arrest this past February added that Jey Uso, Joshua Fatu, was arrested on a similar DUI charge in January of last year, 2018. So, we'll leave you to make your own snarky Uso penitentiary reference about this latest uh, mis misdemeanor for the for these ridiculous talent talented yet clearly troubled twin bros so again fam y'all are taking this shit way for granted you know Naomi you're not safe too that's where you've been in shit before too I don't, I, I don't know uh, that's just me so I, uh, uh, another one another story I think it should be the last story should this, be the, should this be the last story is there anything else I want to talk about anything else 
Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. It's like I'm looking at, I don't see, I don't see anything else for me to talk about. Uh, maybe, maybe this one, Fitzic Man on why on the WWE staying PG but getting edgier. Why Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman were hired. Maybe I should talk about that. Uh, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I'll leave that. I'll just leave that. I'll leave that for another time. But let's end this with this, okay? Last story before I get out of here, okay? More details on Eric Bischoff's and Paul Heyman's WWE roles. And I'm going to talk about this uh, Give Women a Chance after this shit, by the way. Oh, actually, no, I might do that in its own thing. I might give that its own thing. I'm going to give it its own thing. The wrestling world was caught by surprise last month when Bischoff and Heyman were named directors of Raw and SmackDown, respectively, executive directors. But we're only just now beginning to learn the precise details of their roles before they begin in earnest. The latest issue of Wrestling Observer Newsletter notes that the two new honchos will be directly responsible for the for the merchandise of each brand as well as media pu publicity it's understood that Bischoff and Heyman's jobs are distinct from those held by previous head writers of Rod Smackdown they will report to Vince oh, sorry that's my nail clipper they will report to Vince McMahon and be held accountable of uh, their respective brands interact interaction with the rest of the company's departures it was further reported that while Ed Kosky will remain installed as Raw, Raw's head writer, it will be Heyman guiding the actual creative direction of the show. Presumably, it will be the same scenario for Bischoff over on SmackDown. Ultimately, both men will still require Vince McMahon to sign any of their ideas off, so we could discover the situation remaining the exact same. So pretty much... Pretty much, um, you know, I just feel like some. I, a part of me believe that they just got hired for no reason. They just got hired for just for buzz, you know, for people to start talking. Reality, dude. Like, why can y'all like why can why can y'all just turn this into a brand split? You know, yes, you let you let it be known that Bischoff and Paul Heyman. Are running things backstage, but they're not general managers or commissioners or whatever the fuck on TV. You don't let them be on TV, but at least, at least, like, let's make the brand split a thing again, bro. You don't need the wild card to make Raw and SmackDown freaking pop ratings. It didn't work for two months, dude. For two, three months since this whole walk card thing started, nothing has popped off. Nothing has been interesting. I don't want to see Roman Reigns back-to-back -back nights on one week. I don't want to see Shane McMahon back-to-back -back nights in one week. I don't want to see Drew McIntyre back-to-back -back nights in one week. I don't want to see uh, Kofi Kingston, the New Day fucking... Uh, Samoa Joe, Randy Orton, etc., 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 Charlotte Flair, Becky Lynch, etc., 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 Alexa Bliss, Nikki uh, Cross. I don't want to see them twice a week. It's bad enough that some of those people I mentioned, I have to see them once a week, let alone twice. Please, let them choose one show. I, I, like, bro, why, why, why can't we get a, uh, a draft after SummerSlam? They get a draft. I don't care how they do it, Raw, and, Raw or SmackDown, I don't care where. You had them do a draft, shake up, shake things up again, right? You want to call it the Superstar Shake Up? I don't give a fuck anymore. It's the same thing anyway, same concept. So you have them come out, have them have their own podiums, call out the superstars' names, saying you're on my show exclusively. You're you're not going this brand, you're not going that brand. You're still you're staying on my show. Heyman chooses Seth Rollins, Bischoff chooses Reigns. And then we go from there, pretty much. You take, you just pick your superstars. You pick out 20, 20 picks you pick out, right? You have matches in between, but you have 20 picks throughout the entire show. Like, all together, no, like the overall picks are 20, so 10 each. And then 
like 10 major stars pick pretty much each. If you want to include NXT call-ups, you could do that too, like you did in 2016. And then you move on. And then after that, you, you do supplemental drafts where you have this person show up on that show and they stay there. And then, you know, they like Carmella, she's going to Raw with our truth Our uh, Apollo Crews stays on SmackDown. Shinsuke Nakamura stays on SmackDown. Like, why can't we just reintroduce the brand split? Because we fucked up already, okay? We did a version... Uh, 2.1, 2.2, or whatever the fuck, of the, the, the second brand split, because this is trash, bro. I'm sorry. This wild card rule needs to die. I don't give a fuck what USA Network has to say about that. Wild card rule needs to perish. It gotta go. It gotta go. That's my thoughts, and that's what I got to say, and that's 7 Days Podcast. What do you guys think, man? Leave your comments down below. If you guys can, please leave a like. Thank you guys for listening. Subscribe if you're new and leave your comments, man. What do you guys think of Raw Reunion? What do you guys think about, you know, Bischoff and Heyman? You know, their influences backstage? Or has Raw and SmackDown been good? SmackDown was blessed this week. SmackDown was nice. Despite the fact that the women's match were short, like 40 seconds, 45 seconds. But still, it was a best show. It was a nice show, you know? Despite that, Roman Reigns and Civic Man and thing and thing and thing were in the main event. Still! Nice show, you know, from, you know, from the first segment all the way to the, you know, the last segment, which is Kofi Kingston and Randy Orton before, uh, Shane McMahon and Roman Reigns and etc. You know, that whole thing went on. Good show. Good show. You gotta check it out. Go check it out. Please. If you guys can't, like, subscribe. I'm out. I'm out, man. Later.